Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Jen. I'm the co-founding executive director of Second State Press, um, which is located in the Crane Arts Building in Philadelphia, PA. Um, I'm so excited to have you all here for this virtual uh, studio tour. Um, and we are um, absolutely just delighted to have Emmett Ramstad with us. Uh, and he's going to talk about his work and some of his um, experiences here um, since Second State Press um, as a fob holder. Um, I would just want to give special thanks to the Penn Treaty Special Services District and the Philadelphia Cultural Fund for making programs like this possible. Um, and I'd like to now introduce uh, Joanna Booth, who is the program coordinator at Second State Press, who um, is an amazing artist and who has, uh, we are so thankful um, because she's helped coordinate um, tonight's event. Um, so Joanna, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hi everyone. Um, as Jen said, my name is Joanna. I use she, her pronouns. I am the program coordinator at Second State. Um, I'm actually from Philadelphia too. So Second State Press just like has a special place in my heart as a printmaker and native Philadelphian. So it's really nice that I get to help out and make events like this happen. Um, so to introduce our lovely artist today, Emmett Ramstad. Um, Emmett Ramstad's sculpture and participatory works investigate the infrastructure of daily life by modifying the scale and function of familiar household objects. Emmett, or Ramstad lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota and has exhibited works nationally and internationally, including soul exhibitions at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts and Rochester Art Center. He is a recipient of numerous grants and fellowships, including a Francinsonia Sculpture Park Fellowship, Jerome uh, Foundation Fellowship for Emerging Artists, a Metropolitan Regional Arts Council Next Step Award, a Forecast Public Arts and Research Development Grant, and an Art and Change for Grant from the Leeway Foundation. Silly. Yes, represent. He has performed in productions by the Body Cart Cartography Project, made costumes and sets for five touring contemporary dance production, has curated and organized numerous gallery shows. His work is in collections at the Minnesota Museum of American Art, the Wiseman Art Museum, University of Michigan Library, Minnesota Center of Book Arts, MCAD, and Second State Press. He is currently a lecturer in the Department of Art and Art History of Minnesota and at Minneapolis College of Art and Design. So without further ado, I will introduce and allow Emmett to take it away from us. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to thank um, everyone here for choosing to be online with me this evening. Hi, mom. Um, and um, I wanted to thank you, Joanna, for coordinating this um, and Jen for being here and Second State Press for being formative in my art career um, and arranging the studio visit. Um, and I wanted to thank the Mississippi River um, whose water gives life and all the tributaries that feed it as well as all the people now and in the past that have been stewards of the land that I'm on right now. Um, including the Dakota and Ojibwe people um, who um, now and in the past have lived in what's called Minnesota right now. And I wanted to thank my mom and SK for their love and support um, now and forever. Um, and so as I was preparing this talk, um, I was trying to coax my printer to make a copy of a book um, by Yumi Sakugawa's, it's an ebook called Notes on Self-Care for Creative Humans. And um, my printer was not working, like it was a very hand-holding kind of printing experience. And I was thinking about preparing for this talk at the print center and coaxing my really old printer to try to talk to my computer and do it over and over again. Um, and I was thinking about how prints are always aspirational. So I'm making this print for care for myself, um, just like I would stand at a print and hope and hope that the ink works or that I can make this copy right for something that, that is an output. And so um, with humor and navigating technology and um, looking for care is how I'm approaching this talk um, tonight. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, so can you see this? Okay. Um, 
so I wanted to position this talk as um, to, to talk about printmaking and to talk about my current work. Um, so I started out as a printmaker okay. um, and it feels really integral to my work, even though um, it's very rare that I give a talk that includes my prints. Um, so- um, Can I a little bit? Yeah. Like that? Wait, say it again. Your camera on. Oh, is it just noise? I think I think Lindsay, I think you're um you're not muted. There you go. Okay. Okay, great. Um so I wanted to show this this print from 2005. This is from a drain series. Um and I think that this is really the start of like a body of, of work or like what me considering myself to be an artist um, is that I started making these mono prints um, in response to being trans, to living in the Bay Area in the early 2000s, um, wondering like who I was, who my community was and how it was that I, I show that. Um, and so in this time period, I was like getting politically involved and also had a lot of friends that were getting um, trans affirming surgeries um, and, you know, and, and also getting involved with other trans artists organizing art shows and thinking about what that meant. Um, and so on the left um, is this print that comes out of this time period. And then on the right um, is a piece that I made this last year, oh, it says 2021. It was actually, it's probably 2020 now that I think about it, um, called Shitter. And um, I was trying to compare how similar and different they are, um, which is that, so in this piece, Shitter, it's, I live in Minneapolis um, and I made this after there's the murder of George Floyd and the crucial uprisings that happened um, in the wake of that and all during COVID. And I was thinking about how, um, what it is to be in this shit together and how it's disproportionately impacts. And also that it's um, it's kind of like mitigated through this like se separation. And so um, what you see here is it's a, it's a bench toilet. There's um, four holes and there's a plexiglass divider in between them with a trough underneath. So it's like a communal toilet. Um, and so in each of these, I was thinking like how much they are like showing like a symbol or something to represent something, how they both represent like a form of care. So on the left, these are the, it's a part of a drain that was for, um, to drain fluids from the body. And on the right, it is, um, you know, for defecating or urinating, right? There's this like body fluid. And there's also this idea of care and tending to, um, and also, the, the third thing would be like archiving something or marking something. Um, and I really thought, like I still consider myself a printmaker in the way that I'm really interested in the trace or the mark of something. Um, so that, that work drains, um, I was in community with, um, this is James Joda's pho photography on the left um, after a surgery and this gauze um, pieces that were covering his nipples will show up in the next one. And then there, the print on the right is mine, a mono print. Um, and then you can see that in 2006, then I was like, oh, maybe it's not the print. I'm always trying to figure out, is it the print? Is it the thing itself? Is it a representation of the thing? Um, and so this was a friend sent me um, the, gauze, uh, the gauze squares from the top of his nipples. So these are like scabs in these things that I stitched these hands on. So the stitching, and I was thinking about what it meant, like uh, what it means to keep things that are important. Um, who's gonna keep these scabs? Like someone would keep a teeth um, when their child loses their teeth, right? Like I have my kid's teeth now. So this felt like keeping the teeth um, or this like growth moment, right? Um, so these felt like very, um, this felt like this moment where I was moving from printmaking, which was like something that was flat and pushed onto something into like a sculptural thing or into considering what the object itself was. Um, and then I also, um, after that, I started doing all of this research. So it was like, what is it to have a body? What do we keep? What's important to keep? Um, and I uh, was doing research on Robert Chesley, which is on the left. He's a playwright um, that lived in New York and then moved to San Francisco. And this is on the left is his pubic hair collection that's at the LGBT Historical Society in San Francisco. Um, 
and which I've, and now I've done extensive research on him because I'm working on a project of launching his play Jerker um, that we'll do a tour and hopefully we'll come to Philly. Um, we'll be in San Francisco in the spring and then we'll be in Chicago in the summer and then hopefully we'll come to Philly in late summer. But um, anyhow, so he has this pubic hair collection. I was like, all of these, um, it's like gay men in dungeons in the early eighties and how I was thinking when you open it up, you're like, it's all of this body in this archive. Um, and I was thinking about how many of these people are probably dead now um, and the impact of HIV and the impact of AIDS and the what it meant to like, um, to start queer archives. So when I lived in Philly, I was working at William Way Community Center in the archive as a volunteer. So um, both I was at Second State Pass and at the same time I was at William Way. Um, and I was also doing research on Sam Stewart who kept extensive um, documents of his sexual, sexual exploits. Um, and so when at Second State Press, my first series I printed was this series of um, mono prints, which Eli, is this what you have? Okay, you do. Um, so these are, these are mono prints that I made um, at Second State that they are little um, groupings of pubic hair, like tied, and they're very much referencing hair art, Victorian hair art. And I had read this article about, um, it was like 1850s, these two lesbians who had like mailed, you know, like mailed each other these little satchels of pubic hair and then had them made into these little lockets, right? Like commemorating um, the self through the body, um, which very much interested me of like, it felt in keeping with keeping these scabs, right? Um, and so after that, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going around in time periods. Um, one of the things that I really like to do in my work is, um, to do um, like participatory pieces. So I was like, if people are collecting pubic hairs, like Robert Chesley is in the dungeons in San Francisco and shaving people and keeping it in spice jars. Um, and here I am in Minneapolis. And this was at the 30 year mark of um, Ron Athey came to visit and 30 years previous had been um, the big scandal with like the blood spray in the theater um, and the NEA, which corresponded with the NEA, um, like the NEA scandal around politically correct art or who, what could be funded, right? Um, so I made this piece for that event. And what it was was a freestanding station that you could enter through these doors. And you can see it's very visible. There's lighting in here. And you could see there's empty spice jars. And then there's scissors. And then on the right is filled spice jars. So you can see just the very top of some pubic hair in a jar. Um, and so people could come in and they could trim their pubic hair, put it there, and then they could leave. And it was this very visible thing. And so now I have this archive. So I have this growing archive of um, pubic hair, um, which is funny to then move into toothbrushes. Um, so this is a piece from 2016 called Domestic Partnership. Um, and I wanted to show that like this idea of collecting or like signs of the body um, continues to be this theme of like, what is the sign of the body? What is the history and how can I tell a story or a narrative? Um, in this, it was 2016 and um, I was in my driveway in Minneapolis and my neighbor came up and was like, congratulations. And I was like, and he was like, gays can get married now. <laughs> and I, it struck me and immediately, I don't know why, it's the only time this has ever happened that this piece came to me. So this is a 30 foot long toothbrush holder and it's got 180 donated used toothbrushes. And when he said it to me, it felt like, um, you know, like, yeah, that could be true and we don't have universal health care. Like I've started thinking about like a little, you know, one of those four family toothbrush holders. And then I was like, what would it look like if the toothbrush holder was much bigger than that? And if instead of like focusing all of our attention on the union between two people that we were in fact looking at something much larger um, and a bigger issue like universal health care. Um, so I asked, I solicited um, toothbrushes um, from, it took me a year to get this many toothbrushes and they're all in this long um, row. And the other thing that, that I think follows like with the scabs or with the pubic hair is like, you can see here on the left, there's this really cute toothbrush 
which is my mom's. And it's gotten, she painted on nail, nail polish on this toothbrush to be like, this is mine. And you can see like the wear of each of the toothbrushes. Like I'm very interested in how the object shows the trace. Um, just like how in mono printing, like you get like ghost runs. Like, like I love the ghost. It's like what it, what shows what the person does. Um, also when I, when I thought of this, I thought of going to, I remember, I don't know, I must've been in my early twenties. I went to these two, these two men's, um, I, don't know, I feel like it was like a really fancy party. I felt really out of place and their house was perfect and it was all decorated. And I went up into their bathroom and their toothbrushes were like worn to the bristle. And I was thinking about just like, oh man, you have everything perfect and you're super stressed out, you know, and that the object could like tell me this story. So I went downstairs and was like, nice hors d'oeuvres, like, how are you sleeping? You know, like, I was like, I felt like I had this glimmer into their lives. I'm going to quickly go over these socks. Socks, I, I get really interested in an object. So it was like toothbrushes for a while and that, and there was socks before then. When I left Philly, actually, Eli, you probably remember these. I was like making these socks. Um, I was, socks were like, they're a symbol, they're, they could be a symbol, right? Like a symbol of like a particular type of masculinity with the like white athletic sock, but also they can represent this care of like joining together something. It's like the only object that we put together besides mittens, you know? And then, and then you know, I mean, I get really geeky on them. You're like, they're invaginated, you know, when you fold them over. Um, and there's, there's this whole aspect of like doing someone's laundry and putting them together, this like care that's put into it. Um, so I did a ton of socks um, after I left Philly in uh, 2014, 2015. Um, and this is a, a live station. So at 11 o'clock, this is a show at Minneapolis Institute of Arts. And at 11 o'clock, someone would come in and sort they would um, unfold the socks and sort them the way that they wanted to sort them. So it was like getting so many stories from people about the, the proper way to fold a sock. Um, and I felt like the stories themselves were like part of the work, like someone telling something. And so that this object is, that could then represent more than the object itself, but it represents like a lifestyle, a way to, um, to do these ordinary things that you do, um, but by calling attention to it, we could see them in a new way. Um, and at the same time, I was also doing like thinking about our phones and being on our like cell phones. Um, and I got really interested in the connection between like what a bathroom and then also um, a landline telephone, that there are these places you visit and um, yeah, but I would, my note here was don't, don't spend too long on this particular piece, but <laughs> so my note is there. Okay, I'm gonna breathe. So there's all this um, connection, like history coming together, and then in I didn't show like 2017, you know, um, there was that election. And then in 2018, I started making this work um, that I felt like, what does it mean to be in a gestational period? Like I, my child was three, two, three. Um, my dad is like in the early stages of dementia. Um, and we were in this like terrible and continue to be political situation. And, um, and I was thinking about the ways that we're like, we can be both in our body and not in our body at the same time. So like I went to this piece um, called Escape to the Country. I thought of when I, I went to the dentist and you're laying there and there was one of those light panels, you know, and you're like, ah, and they're talking to you, but like I'm actively trying to not be there in my body in in this place and it was like a waiting room so this this is part of a show that i um did in minneapolis called laying in wait um and thinking about what it means to wait and could that could that experience of waiting be productive which now i'm noting to myself i'm like could it be now somehow i feel the pressure now um so this is a drop it's a angled drop ceiling and i've done a number of those since then um, but in this show and in this time period of like thinking about waiting, thinking about medical systems, thinking about care, um, this is a, um, 
a ticket dispenser that I had a friend, um, an artist, Molly Roth Scranton, knit um, a cozy for this, um, this ticket dispenser. And it's called Take a Seat, This Might Take a While. Of just that experience of waiting and could that experience of waiting be better? What would it be to get care in these institutional settings or what, how would it feel different? Like I'm thinking about like waiting in medical lines, like waiting, um, you know, all of the, the um, interface with systems of, of like the bureaucracy of the healthcare system. Um, and um, you know, what would it be if it was different? Um, and this this is an installation called um, "Do You Have a Tissue?" and it's a room. It's an entire room, and it's all the wall is covered with these tissue boxes. Um, and there was a bench, and then in the behind, what you can't see, there was like a a fake aquarium and this beige carpeting, and you walk in and you could sit. Um, and I picked these tissues because in this moment in my life, not only was it like this gestation of waiting, but I was crying a lot. Um, and there was. Uh, these are the same tissues that are where's were at my child's daycare, and then they're the same tissues that were at my therapist's office, and the same tissues that were at the hospitals. And I was like, what what you know, both like educational setting, self-therapy setting, this thing, and they're super scratchy um, and kind of terrible, but there's also this gesture of being like, Would you like a tissue? Like the, this experience of like crying publicly and someone like offering you something is so lovely. And what what is a what is a gesture of care, you know? Because ostensibly these tissues, you could like wipe up any number of like secretions, but you could also like, you know, like wipe off your lipstick, blow your nose, like wipe your tears, like clean up cum, like I mean, there's so many uses and so many different gestures. So I was like very interested in that. Um I'm I really do a lot of bathroom art and this I'm really including not very much of it here, but this is one of the favorite pieces I've ever made. Um again, thinking about this like, could there be like a non-productive, productive space? Um, and here's a bathroom and on the left or on the left of my screen, but actually when you're sitting on the toilet on the right, it was just chip bags and you could eat chips and under the sink here, which is a funny slide, but under the sink here, there was, um, uh, actually it was supposed to be escape to the country episodes and it ended up being figure skating. And so you could eat chips on the toilet with the door locked and watch figure skating. And it just felt like the bathroom as a space of escape and also just deep pleasure um was like felt like really important after doing a lot of like work in like 27 like the year 2016 2017 around like trans bathroom legislation you know to be like okay we're done with like I'm just gonna take a break from that and just eat chips um so that's this um this piece um and so yes I'm doing so good on my 20 minutes loving it um so in 2019, right before the pandemic, I made this piece alone together. So it was like out of this, like, um, I was still like in the bathroom and still like, so I was in the tub and thinking about how my bathtub and this moment that I'm having of like quiet was just like literally like 10 feet away from like potentially my neighbor having the same moment in his bathtub like laying there and then it separated. Um, and I started thinking about how like this like solace that this saw or this like fantasy of like bathroom as, as refuge um, is so connected to other, it's so close, right? So all it's just a door or it's like, we're naked in the tub alone, but we're also together with all, all the other people. Um, so this, it's hard to tell in this picture, but this tub is a normal size one, the close one in the foreground. And in the back is a 15 foot tub and four people can sit in there. Um, and it created kind of a sonic chamber. So when you talk in one, the sound is different. Um, and the, you can take the sidewalk, um, narrow goes from narrow to wide as you go. Um, and I was kind of asking the question of like what it means to come together. And then the pandemic happened. Um, and that was really interesting to me. And then um, in the pandemic, I made this piece. Um, Touch Station, which is also about coming together. The New York um, Public Health published this um, 
I don't, I don't, I, it's not an article. Like, what was it? Like a brochure or like a PDF? I don't know, public health thing about um, having not safe, se safe, COVID safe sex um, and, and anonymous public sex in, in light of the pandemic. And so it was it really interesting to see them actually talk about glory holes as a safe solution to having sex um, and to really get clear, not just about like, um, yeah, just to like have a really frank conversation. People are gonna be having sex. Like, how can we do that? Um, and it really reminded me of, and going back to the archive and the people I was researching within like early HIV AIDS conversations, here we are in COVID having that. And so, um, but it's so specific to a gay male audience where like a phallus goes through a hole and is sucked. And then, so I'm making this, that maybe this touch station, which um, was to have outdoor public sex. Um, and it's got this, a plexiglass screen and, and both of them, you see there's two levels and then they can get turned um, the screen. So it, it enables different kinds of um, vapor barrier. So you're outside, but it's like a, basically like a sneeze guard. Um, and so the, the idea is like how, like opening up that conversation of what it means to touch within, um, with a barrier. And I, um, and also like, and, you know, because it's my last slide. Oh no, there's one more. Um, the thinking about like the breath on the screen and like all of the plexiglass as this kind of like trace and this print too. Um, and so here's my last slide, which is um, another print I made at Second State Press. Um, and I was thinking in this one, this is based on another archive. Um, this is Forrest Bess. Forrest Bess was a painter um, and his work was included in the Whitney Biennial, I think in 2013. Um, and Robert Gober wrote about it. Um, and it was kind of like sensational, the writing, and I was reflecting on um, that. And so I, what I did is I did sketches of the paintings while I was there. And then from my memory, then I made these mono prints based on the paintings and um, thinking about retelling a story. Um, yeah, and, and where was I gonna say? Let me look at my notes. Um, I think that's, no, I, I can't. My notes were on my slide that didn't work. So I think that's where I'm gonna end. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening and I'm open to questions. Thank you so much, Emmett. Um, it's so interesting to see like your work go from like the 2D space to a lot of like 3D and interactive, interactive work. Um, but one of my first questions was, you describe your works as being participatory and inspired by functions of everyday life. Um, what sentiments do you hope your audience take away from like, experiencing and participating in your work? When I, um, when I really reflect on what I think art does in general is um, allow people to pause for a moment and think about life in a different way. Um, and so by using for these really familiar objects, like a toothbrush, what I've found is that there's already a relationship. It's not foreign. The toothbrush is a really um, generic item. And so because of that, there's already a relationship. Um, I find that it blooms into a story, like, and a question of like, but there's so many of them, like you, or like, yes, like there's like a, um, attraction to the ordinary in this way. Um, and so I think that like, it, in, in many ways I'm like, as doing sculptural work is like trying to figure out like, is it the object itself? Is it a representation of the object? Is it a print of the object? Like, but all, all said like the, the idea of the everyday life is, all, is, is a desire to relate to people's intimate spaces, yeah. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And also I wanted to just uh, post to everyone, if you have like a question that like piggybacks off of something that Emmett has just said, please feel free to hop off of mute. Um, I also have set questions too, just to keep the conversation going. Um, my next question would be like in your statement, you pose the question of being able to relate across difference through collective care. Um, in your opinion, what are some of the most valuable forms of collective care and how do you convey that in your work? It's so interesting 
in right now to be thinking about what collective care could be, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that there's like been so much conversation and so many, I've gone to so many art talks now about um, care. I think I feel really influenced by, um, there's a book by Cassie Thornton um, called Hologram about like a feminist um, model of healthcare that is about creating small groups and, and taking care. And also um, the arts organization in the Bay, Sins Invalid, um, is a disability arts organization that um, their blogs throughout the pandemic have been like, hey, we've been doing this forever. It's called helping each other. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I started thinking about care a lot when I started doing mending and darning work and, and really um, trying to pay attention to or call out, like, not just like, taking care of something like the object, but also the person and that, that like act of love of doing someone's laundry or, um, and so I think, yeah. So valuable forms of collective care, I think are ways of coming together um, that are tending to the body. Rebecca Brown wrote a book. Um, she was a early hospice AIDS worker um, and it was gifts of the body. And her whole book is about each chapter is blood, sweat, tears. Um, I can't remember what the other chapters are, but each of them are stories of taking care of people's bodies. And to me, I think that that is a really valuable form. And so instead of the bodies being represented in my work, it's the objects. But there's a person behind every object. Yeah. Right. I think that's like really interesting that this time is calling for that. Well, like, especially like through the pandemic, it's definitely calling for that type of care, but it's also been isolating in a way that we haven't been able to like I don't know, be in in present with other people so it's nice to kind of have that reminder through through your works that like this is what makes us human that we like take care of each other yeah. um uh, I guess that kind of segues pretty nicely into my next question um of like how do you conceive of collaboration in your work for example your exhibition laying in weight incorporated other artists bringing key pieces like your friend that um darn that or did the snuggy thing for yeah. the ticket yeah, the, um, ticket to how do you, yeah. sorry um how does this type of collaboration come about and does this kind of feed into your concept of collectivity I think that one of the reasons that I'm so interested in archives is that um, I'm trying to figure out like, you know, what my life is and what traces are there, right? So in each of the works, like I can, I'm smiling because my friend SK is here and my mom and both of them, SK was pictured, my mom's toothbrush, um, there, you know, like there, there are parts of my life that show up across um, my work. And so that collaboration feels like I could be bringing up these, these ways that care is coming up and also that I'm being cared for and that the, my community is coming into the work. So like the pubic hair of like, I don't know how many people um, that, that I will exhibit, right? Like it's like this, um, it's both mine and it's something larger. Um, and I also like, so I think that that question of being like, um, where do I come from? Um, who supports me, what, how, how do we show this, um, lends itself to collaboration. And I think especially, um, I think the early stages was very much about like donation. Like I want pieces of you, <laughs> I want like your favorite care. I want your, I want pieces, I'm gonna show it. I wanna, I wanna save it. Cause what if, what if people die? Like there's like a fear in there too. Um, and then I also think that there's this way that as artists, um, we're always um, collaborating to a certain extent. Like I think very much about like that, like Second State Press, right? Any, all the fob holders are then making a print. They're making individual print. And then I don't know if everyone did this, but when I was at Second State Press, it's like I make a print, but then I made a print with Chris Harshorn and Emily Squires, right? And then that print is there and it's not, so it's like, my individual work is being represented. And then, but that can never, be understood without the greater context of all the artists that surround it. Um, and I think now I'm especially interested in like I'm in, in doing collaborations because I feel so alone um, coming out of the pandemic and I want to be working with people. Um, 
And I think it's very much a part of a, a lot of artists practice, even if um, it's not collaborative in nature, the final product, it's always the result of someone bringing you soup when you're sick, you know? Yeah, I, I can totally resonate with that. And I'm, it's like nice to be able to have, you know, these virtual spaces where we are able to come together, but still kind of craving that, um, I don't know, in-person collaboration, which is thankfully starting to be able to happen now after it feels like so long. Um, and so. printmakers are amazing at that. I mean, that was one of the coolest things is to see like any year of like which people are coming together and what are they doing, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's so awesome. Yeah, yeah, I'm just thinking of um, like the, our animal like print exchange and all that. It's just like, that is so integral to printmaking is being in community and kind of sharing pieces of ourselves mm -hmm. with each other. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, um, and then when I was in Second State, this, so these hot dogs, then I, this print is for asbestos painting. It's not supposed to be hot dogs, but then because of this print, I was like, oh, and I put on a hot dog show. Jen, do you remember that? I, that show is still one of my most favorite shows that we've ever had, the hot dog show. Hot dog. Do you remember that, um, like, hot dog maker? Yeah. That, like, that was it found at, like, the thrift store or something? Yes. Um, yes. That was kind of, like, scary and sketchy, but, like, you put the hot dogs on these things and plug it in, and it, like, cooked them. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. There's still um, some, like, wheat pasted like little hot dog thing on one of the pillars that's that's still there so yes. I'm reminded of that show a lot yes that sounds so fun it was good <laughs> <laughs> um my last question kind of goes in a slightly different direction and then I'll open it up to everyone um I was reminded uh reading through your bio again that you actually um kind of you do like clothing construction and construct sets and um, I was wondering how that feels in comparison to doing some of these art installations like is it a similar process or do you kind of put yourself in a different headspace to do those types of constructions yeah that's a good question um yeah when I got out of grad school I was like yeah I was you know like making this work and so excited and then these choreographers um we're like, hey, do you think you could do these costumes? And I'm like, yeah. Um, and sets, like that's just like a big installation. You know, like it's um, and it felt very much like I, I used to be a hairdresser. Um, and it felt very much like um another way of like taking care of the body. It was like dressing people, you know, and like thinking about it was the skill set of like. What does the choreographer want? Um, what's their vision? And then how, what, you know, where's my voice fit in this? Um, but I think that like, because the, my work is so body-based that like then them fitting and sewing to people felt very much part of what I was doing um, or like felt very much part of my work or um, somehow I was like, oh, I could size this person or I could like find, like when I was in Philly, it's probably not the case, it's not the case anymore, but I could find, I was looking for all these animal print pants. This was like 2013. So there was like a ton in Philly, also sweatpants, which I love. Um, and uh, yeah, so it felt like partly a continuation and I, I phased out of doing it a lot because it's also like so many things teaching and other things that I was like, it's, it's um, running parallel to my work. And then also it's so much easier to do um, someone else's vision <laughs> too. Um, so I, I don't do it as much anymore, but I do think um, some of the sets that I made um, were so influenced. Like one set I did was I went to France, my brother um, and his partner are choreographers at, in the company Body Cartography Project. And there was a set, the dancers, I did all their costumes, but the set was like underwear, socks, toothbrush, like all of these grooming implements. And then dancers would come up and use little microphones and kind of like touch the underwear or touch the <laughs> soap. Um, but each of those little stacks then showed up and work like years later, like a whole bunch of soap or like, you know, underwear on a shelf. Like it was very, um, very much part of my work yeah and that and I haven't done it for a minute yeah yeah now that you explain it, it seems like there's very much like a one-to-one -one connection and it makes sense just both being 
so in tune with the body and um, sets our installations in, in a similar way. So Yeah, and I love teaching, like now I teach at the University of Minnesota and I like love teaching performance. Like mm-hmm. I, just, I, don't, I don't feel like the things are necessarily separate, right? So in the pandemic, like during the pandemic, you know, I haven't really, the sculptures that I made are a series of squatty potties. So like wooden squatty potties, you know, which is very much in keeping with my work and like, you know, and learning to do animation or doing this collaboration on a play. Um, Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Um, I'm wondering now if anyone has any questions for Emmett in our last or so minutes. I don't have questions, but I can break awkward silence. Um, I just really appreciate um, kind of your dedication to collecting things. I was, you know, I'm sitting in here looking around this room and I'm like, oh, there's the like medicine chest where I have every tea bottle I've ever taken. I don't know what to do with it. I don't know that I'd love it displayed, but, um, and I recently found the last bra I wore, which I, I didn't even wash. And so it's been in this plastic bag for like 20, what are we looking at? 20 some years, yeah. um, almost 20 years. And it smells so bad. I was just yeah. like, oh, like I'm going to leave it though. Like this idea of it just like slowly kind of decaying in this bag um, <laughs> kind of is fitting. It seems to make sense. Um, yeah. And then just like, I don't know. I have like a weird nightlight you gave me on my shelf. which is like, oh, I kept that. <laughs> like These yeah. things just kind of like, yeah, just kind of accumulate and telling a story, but also like bridging connections and stuff. I mean, I love that stuff, right? Like if you were like, I'm moving and I have this bra that's been in a bag for 20 years, you know, this part of me would be like, I think I need to keep it. Mm-hmm. But then I, I also know that. who I'd call if I didn't want to keep it. I, <laughs> I know I'd be like, uh, <laughs> get rid of my own stuff. But like that seems really important to keep. Very important. <laughs> yeah, then, you, then you're like, William Wade, you want it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> William Wade wants that. They would definitely take it. Yeah. Any other questions for Emmett? For those of you who aren't in Philly, William Way Community Center has the, there's the LGBT archive on the third floor. Um, so that's what that reference is. There's a, a question in the chat um, uh, from Kim. It says, could you speak a little bit more about your development of your work in relation to transness or in relation to a trans art making community? Totally. Um, I feel like, I mean, the impetus, and and I see this a lot with students too, is like the impetus for making a lot of work was came out of, um, and I think this is probably true for you too, Eli, is like coming coming out of this, like, who am I? What am I doing? Who's my community? What feels important? And for me, a lot of those early prints were like, what are, what is the semiotics of gender? You know, like, is it this hand, the size of my hand? Is it this, like looking for signs and symbols, um, both within myself and within community. Um, and so I think that like that, that felt really integral. And then I went to grad school um, and it was shocking to me to that, or not shock, it shouldn't have been shocking, but it was a very unsupportive community. Um, and I felt like I had to, instead of making work that was really, speaking to trans experience, um, my own experience that I really had to kind of like separate it and make it more universal um, and be like, no, 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 I'm talking about not like trans people, I'm talking about skin, you know, like, because I just, I wanted to like separate it away from that. And it was this like kind of a self-protective move. And then also seeing like trans and queer artists, um, as far as showing work, it felt like really hard to get a show or be in any show that wasn't in June and wasn't like LGBTQ specific. Um, so it was like, how, how do I how do I do this? And and I think part of that is like trying to step into something that felt like more universal. And I really struggle with that now because you know universal is a very subjective position. There is no universal. Like it's very. Um, related to like race, gender, all of these things, right? So to claim that I'm like, oh, and this thing is universal, it's not the right move. But at that, at the moment I was like, how do I, 
how do I broaden my work and my audience, or at least to get an audience that's interested, that's not just like, this is trans and that's it, right? Because it's like trans and it's body and it's care and it relates to all these things. Like, how do you develop an audience that can see like that part that's so important and see the other parts, right? Um, so I think that that like has been like a, a process across the work um, and I think that that's true about like sexually explicit work or like including things like pubic hair or like now making this like touch stations or thinking about public sex or things like that is like weaving in and out of like what feels relatable or socially acceptable or digestible. Um, and I see that, I, I don't know, probably a lot of people here um, feel the same in their work, you know, is like always trying to navigate the relationship between individual identity and emphasis in the work and a broader audience. Thank you for that question and answer. Um, do we have any other questions before we wrap up our night? I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much, Emmett, for taking time to uh, share your work and um, and to you know come back and connect with us at Second State Press. Um, I love these virtual studio talks because um, you know we would never really be able to connect this way um, if it weren't for this kind of platform. So um, as wild as the past uh, year and a half has been, I am thankful for. Uh, being able to connect um, with creative people that we care about um, far and wide. So I'm um, very grateful um, for you taking the time to do this. Oh, thank you so much. It's so great to see you all. And I, it was so such an honor to like actually be asked back into Second State Press and be like, oh, it was really formative, my time. And I really appreciate that opportunity to reflect on printmaking in my practice and you all specifically and what Philly, like the, my, my two years that I lived in Philly was really formative. It's amazing. Yeah. Once, once you're in Philly, you're always, you always <laughs> have a piece of Philly. <laughs> and apparently there's hot dogs in Philly still. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, thanks everyone.